Good morning and welcome to Faith Lutheran Church. Seventeenth Sunday of Pentecost. Today's sermon comes from the book of Mark, chapter 9, verses 30 to 37, titled, Who is the Greatest in the Kingdom? with Pastor Ken Cody. Next comes from the Gospel of Mark, which we just read, and I'll just read verse 33 and 34. And they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you discussing on the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. This is our text. Dear friends and believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. As we continue our readings on Mark, we begin to see that Jesus is preparing his disciples for his death and resurrection. In verse 31, Jesus says, The Son of Man is going to be delivered over to men, and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise on the third day. Now, that seems to be a clear statement, but the disciples did not understand what Jesus was saying. And the text says, well, they were afraid to ask. You know, sometimes we are afraid, too, to ask other people when they talk about dying. We feel very uncomfortable. But for the disciples, it was another reason. The idea that the main mission of the Messiah was to die on the cross was simply not part of their thinking. Their idea of the Messiah was that the Messiah would be a great political leader. He would drive out those nasty Romans out of Jerusalem. And then he would clean up the corrupt clergy in the synagogues. And then he would establish the, the nation of Israel into a great empire, as it was during the times of kings David and Solomon. And so Jesus, talking to them about his imminent death made them feel uncomfortable. And it wasn't until after the resurrection that the disciples finally understood that what Jesus was telling them back then was about what he was going to do after his death. Now, we do live after the resurrection. And we can read the Bible, and we know exactly what Jesus meant when he spoke those words. But still, we fall into the same trap that the disciples did, which is recorded in the second part of our text. Jesus asked them in verse 33, What were you discussing on the way to Capernaum? But the disciples kept silent. They must have been embarrassed because they had argued with one another who would be the greatest in the kingdom. Kind of sounds a little bit like Muhammad Ali, doesn't it? Now, here is the thing that changes moods. Jesus was talking about his death and the disciples were jockeying for a position of greatness, of leadership in the kingdom. So what does Jesus do? Have you ever been interrupted when you, when you speak something that's really dear to your heart and then the subject has changed? Well, here's what Jesus did when they changed the subject on him. He used their arrogance, their self-importance, to teach them and us a lesson about leadership in the church. He says, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. <clears throat> you see, in God's kingdom, in the church, the leaders serve. The one who is the highest makes himself the lowest. And the leader sacrifices, not to gain power, 
but to serve others. And Jesus made that point very clear, because right after having said that, he takes a little child into his arms, and then he says to his disciples, serve the child. That's kind of what we're doing today, isn't it, with opening of Sunday school? And then Jesus says this, which is quite remarkable, something I think we all need to hear again and again. In verse 37, Jesus says, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, and whoever receives me receives not me, but my Father in heaven. Well, Jesus is saying something quite profound there, isn't he? That when we see a child and serve that child, we are serving Jesus and God the Father. But Jesus wasn't only asking us to serve those that are young physically, but also those who are young spiritually and mentally who happen to be in older bodies. You see, there are a lot of middle-aged and older people who are spiritually young and mentally young when it comes to know the knowledge of God, why they are here on earth, what their purpose is, what Jesus came to accomplish. Most people think he's a pretty good social worker. That's why he came. So when we talk about serving others, I think we need to ask, how are we doing? If we are servants, do we serve because we want to share the love of God in Jesus Christ? Or do we serve so that we can become notice or to hear people tell us how wonderful we are? And how often do we get angry when we serve and people don't acknowledge our contribution? Do we serve with all our heart? Or is our service only praiseworthy deep? In other words, if I don't receive some praise, I get mad. I feel unappreciated. God judges our hearts, and he knows the intentions and our motives. And here's what Jesus had to say about those people who, in a sense, demand praise, honor, and glory. And we're speaking about people here in the church in general. In Matthew 6, 1 to 4, Jesus says, Beware of practicing your righteousness before others in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So, when you give to the needy, don't sound a trumpet that goes before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by others. And the hypocrites that he's talking about here in the synagogue are the church leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the teachers of law, the Sadducees. Jesus says, truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. So that your giving will be in secret. And God who sees in secret will reward you. Nobody knows what you gave but you. As far as you know. Now this passage comes from the Sermon on the Mount, and I think it's one of the saddest thoughts in Scripture when you look at what Jesus is saying here. Sad, because they have received their reward in their praise on earth now. Sad. Because there is no reward, no heaven for them later. Jesus said, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. 
when you seek and expect praise. So how are we doing as servants? Well, I can tell you I'm not a very good servant. In fact, I'm a lousy servant. And how about you? And what is our excuse? Unlike the disciples, we know that Christ died on the cross to forgive us of our sins. We know that he was raised from the dead to proclaim victory over death, so that in our death, because of our faith in the Christ who died for us, we will someday rise too. And while we are waiting, we know that we are to serve others. But sometimes we don't want to be servants, we want to be boss. Sometimes we even want to judge God when his teachings do not say what we want them to say. Sometimes we consider ourselves the greatest, even greater than the teachings and revelation of God who created us. Let me give you an example. A couple of years ago, well, more than a couple of years, but Augsburg Publishing put out some Sunday school material. And one of the lessons was on uh, Jonah being swallowed up by the well. Well, they treated it as a myth, that it didn't actually happen. And so it's just a story to show us how God cares and loves us and will always be with us. Well, in the New Testament, Jesus says, just as Jonah was in the belly of the big fish for three days and three nights, so I will be in the belly of the earth for three days. Just as. Just as Jonah is a myth, never happened, was never really swallowed by a big fish, so Jesus' death and burial is a myth, never really happened. Do you see how we become greater than the word when we deny it? Sometimes we deny more than what we know. Even though we sometimes think like that, God still wants to rescue us. He still wants to be us to be a part of his kingdom, his family. And he still wants to rescue us from our own pride. And that's why he sent his son, Jesus, to become one of us here on earth. You see, God sent Jesus to be the servant that we could never be. Isaiah the prophet writes about this great servant some 700 years before the servant Jesus was conceived and born. And listen how he starts out about this servant who is Jesus. Behold my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up, and he shall be exalted. But how will he act wisely? How will he be lifted up and exalted? Then Isaiah, speaking 700 years before the act happened, before the birth of Christ, speaks about what Jesus will do as though it already happened. He speaks of it in the past tense. How is he going to be exalted? He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows to the cross. And yet, we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God. We looked at him as though God was punishing him for sins that he had committed. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that brought you and me peace. And with his stripes, 
we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. I mean, every time Jesus was slapped in the face, whipped, it heals us. Because God determined to punish Jesus and not us. God came down from heaven to serve you and me. And Isaiah includes us in that text. And what did we do? We beat him, we whipped him, and we drove nails through his wrist to the cross. And still Jesus served us perfectly. And he was highly exalted in every slap he received. He deserved service from us, but he served us with his life instead. He sacrificed him, himself in order to save us from our sins and from the consequences of our sin, which is eternal damnation. And although he deserved to be first, he made himself last. And this is the same servant Jesus who hugged little children and told the disciples and us that when you do that, you are serving me and God the Father. And here is such great news. The perfect servant Jesus sacrificed himself in order to save us from the condemnation of our imperfect service. God the Father honored this service of Jesus by calling him out of the grave. And when Jesus rose from the grave, that was God's pronouncement to the world, to us, that just as Christ was raised from the grave, so we too shall rise from the grave on that great and wonderful day. Now, God the Father sees our woefully inadequate service as perfect service through repentance and faith. Jesus now declares you worthy to receive him, even if God the Father comes to you in a little child. And he continues to serve us, not only in word, but in baptism and in the Lord's Supper. And on that last day of time of history, he will raise us from the grave and he will serve you personally with a holy and perfect body where you will forever serve him in perfect holiness, righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. And in heaven, you and I, it'll never come to us. It'll never even be part of our thinking of asking, who is the greatest? Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thanks for viewing today's sermon. Faith Lutheran Church is located at 3000 Cannon Road, 8 Southeast, St. Cloud, Minnesota, 56304. Phone 320-252-3315.